I'm delighted to say I'm joined on the line uh, by the one and only John Giles. John, very good evening to you. Evening, Richie. Uh, I have to say, you joined us at a pretty turbulent time, John. We're seeing games uh, called off at a rate of knots. Five more matches in the Premier League uh, called off for this weekend, and that's uh, just conservatively. I think we could see probably uh, one or two more added to that as well. It's obviously a difficult time for teams and and how to you know set themselves forward and prepare for it. games that they don't know if they're going to go ahead and massive numbers of coronavirus cases within certain squads. It's a very, very uncertain time for teams. Well, it's not good, uh, Richie. You know, we, we we think it's over sometimes and then it comes back again. And, uh, you know, especially in the in the, in the the Premiership, uh, matches, you know, a couple called off already, as you say. Um, and there's a, a lot of controversy over the vaccination for players. And uh, because it seems that... Uh, what we're told, anyway, that uh, you know, there's there's an awful lot of players not taking the vaccine, so that's not helping. That's for sure, Richie. Mm. You know, the figures are out earlier on today. I mentioned them there just before the break. Um, in the Premier League, mm. uh, six, only sixty eight percent of players in the Premier League are double jabbed. So mm. the like thirty two percent of Premier League players have decided, you know what, I I don't need this. And then when we go down into the the football league, so uh, the Championship, League One, League Two, twenty five percent of players there say they've no intention at all of being vaccinated. And yet we're seeing uh, this virus spread like wildfire amongst footballers, and we're seeing as a result of that games uh, being called off. Um, Jurgen Klopp obviously has been fairly vocal about his, you know, desire to see players get vaccinated or to get boosted if they've already been vaccinated. And Liverpool, it seems, have up until tonight because they've got three positives, have been uh, pretty clear of things so far. But there does seem to be more of a, you know, a need for managers like himself or at least bigger figures in the game that are currently active within the game to encourage things along here, not to preach, not to force people to do anything, but at least to offer sensible words of encouragement because. Clearly, to 32% of Premier League footballers, the message isn't getting through despite everything that's going on at the minute. Well, I, I must I, I read the, the Klopp article this morning and I must say I agree with him, uh, Richie. You know, like this is a, it, it's a most unusual uh, situation because, as you know, uh, you, you can spread it without knowing you're spreading it. And, uh, like, I think what they're trying to do now to, is to get the players to... Uh, to, to take the, the vaccination is to say, well, look, if you, if you have to quarantine for 10 days or you can't play, then we're not going to pay you. Uh, and that could well be the case because, you, like, you can't make players, uh, well, look, it looks like Klopp has, uh, take, take the vaccination. But uh, I think it's, I think with players in that situation, it's not fair on the colleagues and uh, people around the club, and what, what will happen is you get more and more matches building up, uh, being postponed, Richie. So, uh, obviously, Klopp has had uh, a great deal of influence on his players uh, getting the vaccination, and I, I'd have to say I, I, I agree with what he's done. Like He mentioned yesterday about it being a matter of, of solidarity and, I guess, of respect for your teammates, and at some point, you would think... Uh, an air of professional responsibility has to come into this thing. I mean, you mentioned there the idea of of, of pretend, potentially withholding wages from players who don't do that. Like Bayern Munich have, have essentially trialled that. A couple of players, uh, Joshua Kimmich was one of them, uh, Eric Maxim Chupamoting was another, and Jamal Musialia, I think, was the was was one of the others, where they said that they weren't going to be vaccinated and for one reason or another, they ended up missing games, missing training sessions because they either had to restrict their movements or they had to self-isolate. And as a result, they weren't paid for those days in which they were isolating. That's something you'd welcome being brought in across the board at, at different clubs? I would. Uh, yes, I would, uh, Richie, because, uh, you know, this is not a, a, a situation where uh, if you don't believe you should have a vaccination uh, with other illnesses, and it doesn't affect anybody else. But the problem with this uh, uh, virus is that you're, you're passed it on to others. It's not just about you. It's about people you're, you're working with or playing with in, in football in a football sense that you, you pass it on to them. So it's not just about you. Uh, I mean, I can understand people, and in, in, in for certainly religious reasons, doing certain things. 
but it's affecting them. If, it, if, it, if it's not right, it affects them. But they're not passing on the illness to other people in this situation. Uh, you know, people are passing it on. They don't even know they're passing it on. This is the problem. It's not, it's not just about the individual. It's about their colleagues in football, anyway, about their colleagues and passing it on to, to, to other players. Yeah, and it's, it, it, we, we do forget sometimes, I guess, that, that footballers are people and footballers are people that exist in the wider world. They don't just exist in a bubble of, you know, football clubs and they're out there. And, and we spoke to you when this first, you know, broke and I, I remember there was a certain deal of, I hope you don't mind me saying, there was a certain deal of fear in your voice when we were talking initially before the vaccines became in because you just had to be super careful because we didn't know enough about this and we, you know, you needed to stay away from things as much as you possibly could. Things have changed somewhat, things have developed, people have been able, you're, you know, the fact that you're vaccinated, I believe you're probably boosted now as well, are you, John? I am, yeah. thank goodness. And I'm still scared, yeah. <laughs> Richie, because, I mean, we, we read about it because even people who, are, who have the vaccinators and, and, and all the various things can still pick up the illness. You know, you can still do it. So I'd still, I'd still want to be very, very careful. But I, I just don't, I just don't see the logic. Well, I see the logic in it. People don't want to have it done. But fun, funny enough, footballers, professional footballers, uh, have the biggest rate of not getting the, the vaccination for some reason. You know, I mean, I think maybe it's because they're, they're young, healthy. They, they feel they're not going to uh, die from it. But the but the thing is, and I keep repeating myself here, they keep they pass it on to other people who are not so lucky. Well, on, so on, on, I just don't, don't get it. On on the whole thing of, of of solidarity, like if you're a footballer, like you have a professional responsibility to keep yourself fit. So if you're coming, yes. if you're coming up to Christmas, say you don't go mad on the mince pies and you don't have a massive dinner the day before you're due to play on Stevens's day because you have a responsibility to not be 20 stone yes. ambling around a pitch. Similarly, you surely have a responsibility to keep yourself as healthy as possible. And if there are measures with which you can keep yourself healthy or at least mitigate against being severely sick, then surely it's incumbent upon you as a professional, no matter if you're a footballer, if you're a journalist, if you're a farmer, if you're whatever, you go and do whatever is going to help you be healthy and help those around you stay healthy. Yeah. And I don't see why, like I struggle to see why, I don't know about you, why 32% would just shrug their shoulders and go, that's, that's Grant, don't worry about it, it's fine. I don't, I don't get it. I just don't get it, Richie. I mean, it's, I think it's a very selfish uh, uh, response to things that are going on around you because you're, you are responsible to your colleagues. You're in the dressing room. Mm. Their livelihood depends. Everything depends on the club. Depends on the club that are paying you. Depend depends on keeping everybody right. And it's a very very difficult thing to do any, anyway. So I, I, I just don't agree with. It. I think Klopp. I read this article this morning. Obviously, I think it looks like all his players uh, have had the vaccination and doing the best they can to help each other uh, in their in their profession uh, and indeed in their life and. That makes that makes sense to me. It doesn't make sense to me where there's footballers and there's there's 25, 26, maybe 30 percent not taking the vaccination, which is obviously a protection from this particular virus. Mm. Uh, let's move on to cheerier matters. John, okay. Le Leeds yeah. getting beaten 7-0 the other night by Manchester <laughs> yeah. City. Um, yeah. I just wanted to get your thoughts on it because 7-0s don't come around too often um, and they can be you know, a, a, I guess a signpost that things are bad, but it seems to be a confluence of factors whereby Leeds are missing players, Manchester City are you know rolling at the minute. They're, they're they've got players coming back fit, like Kevin De Bruyne is back hitting his his stride again. It just seemed to be the worst case scenario for Leeds came true the other night. Have you any great worries beyond the actual scoreline? Uh, well, I, I would I wouldn't be happy about it. Uh, uh, that's that's for sure, Richie. Yeah. Uh, it can't do anybody any good. But I think it's an exceptional situation at Leeds at the moment. You know, they've got, uh, you know, Phillips is out, Bamford is out, probably the two best players, and there's about three others who, who would be in the team who are not are, are fit. And they don't have a big panel, uh, so they pay the price. And I think when, when, you're, when you're in the situation they're in with the injuries and the players that they've got, I mean, the worst team you can play at the moment for, for giving you hiding in that way is, is Manchester City. I, I, I think as they get the players back, uh, they'll, they'll be okay. Mm. I, I, I don't think they'll go down, uh, but you don't want to be in the position that they're in. Obviously, uh, Richie, you know, it's not good. And to get the hiding, they did. But, uh, you know, I think if they get the players back, 
I think they'll, they'll, they'll re- avoid relegation, let's put it that way. I think they're probably helped at the minute. There's a couple of teams that are quite obviously uh, far worse off than them, uh, especially because Leeds, even with Bamford missing, like we saw it against Chelsea the other day, they, they do have an eye for goal. There's an ability to actually find the net there, which are the teams below them. Uh, certainly lack, I'm thinking of Norwich, I'm thinking of Newcastle, uh, case in point. But does a 7-0 linger? Like I, like, I don't know the ins and outs of the, the, the Leeds dressing room, but like when you're tanked that badly, I don't know if it's happened to you too much during your career, but when you're tanked that badly, does it? I'm sure it would affect different players different ways. But as a squad, you know, is the best thing to do just kind of dust your hands and move on. Well, that's that's the only way to do it. You know, learn from it uh, and and go on from there. Uh, I, I I did have experience uh, twice in my career. Okay, <laughs> I wasn't expecting that, John. Yeah, we played uh, West Ham. Years ago, this would be in the well, 63, 64. We just played Arsenal on the Saturday. Mm-hmm. Uh, had a very good win. Uh, it was a League Cup. Uh, playing on the Monday night. I think it was 7-0, Richie. Wow. 7-0. Now, they were brilliant. They were a very good team, but they weren't as... Like, we went up, but we didn't affect us. I know that... I think the next match we played in, we won. It was just one of those nights where actually they were, they were absolutely brilliant. It was Bobby Moore and Johnny Bourne and uh, they were a terrific team at that time. They didn't, they didn't win much, but uh, they gave us a right height anyway. But on the, on the Saturday, I think we won again. And, and the other experience I had of it, uh, when I was playing for West Brom, player manager, uh, Richie, yeah. we played Ipswich on my birthday. Oh Lord, and there would have been a fairly decent Ipswich side at that at that oh, stage. Very so, good. This yeah. was Mariner and these guys. Yeah, seven nil. Wow, seven nil. But uh, now, funny enough, they played so well that I couldn't say anything. Anything, you know. Yeah. But but I must say, I think it was four weeks, five weeks later, we played them at West Brom, and we beat them four nil. So I, I remember coming back on the bus even. I it was one of those days where they were absolutely brilliant. We couldn't do anything about it. Mm. Uh, it was my birthday and I actually stopped at a, at a pub and got a good few drinks for the lads on the way home so in other words forget about it it's yeah. just one of those days and we, we picked up straight away then uh, just looking back on that 7-0 against West Ham so it was uh, 1966 it was in November of 66 so we're talking about the likes of, of Martin Peters Bobby Moore and Jeff Hurst um, Jeff Hurst I think scored three that night yes Um they would have been just, what, four months off winning the World Cup, so not a bad side. Um, that next game that you referenced was a victory for Leeds, a 3-1 victory. Do you, do you want to have a, a hazard a guess of who scored twice that day, John? Which, which match was that? You play, uh, played Leicester at home after the 7-0. Do you want to guess who scored twice for, for yourselves that day? Um, Billy Bremner. A certain Mr. Jay Giles. Oh, did got two that day, yeah. <laughs> There you go. Not after the West Ham match. After the West Ham match, you're in a bit of form that year. Actually, looking looking at you, yeah, you got one against uh, West Ham in the league. Then a, a week or two later as well. So you, you were fond of uh, fond of finding the net in sixty six, sixty seven. It's safe to say. <laughs> yeah. Oh, uh, that's good. I, I didn't, I didn't, know, I didn't know about that, Richard. But, but yeah, well, that stands for your question. Yeah, you can pick up from it. <laughs> Fing- <laughs> you can pick up from it. Yeah. Fingers crossed. They've got the the DVD of the sixty six, sixty seven season knocking around Ellen Road, and they can pick themselves back up yeah, after they that. Might do that. Yeah. <laughs> Um, speaking of goal scorers, we saw a great one have to take their bow during the week. Sergio Aguero, unfortunately, at the age of just 33, uh, announcing that he's stepping away from the game. He obviously suffered those heart problems while playing for Barcelona against Alaves a little bit earlier on in the season. He said that following the medical vi- advice he received um, since then, it was quite clear to him that he couldn't continue playing football. Um, but I think he's one of these players that the further we get away from him, we'll probably realise how good he was. Aye, aye. One of the greats, uh, uh, in my opinion, Richie, and lots of other opinions, and uh, I, I, w- I wouldn't say a lot of players were one of the greats, but what he did, he, one of the great goal scorers, and obviously if you're a great goal scorer, you're going to be a great player. I mean, I was just looking at, at his stats, which I, I'm not too sure of, uh, generally is. His career goals was 427, Richie, wow. in 786 games. For Man City... 390 games, 260 goals. Now, this is unbelievable stuff. And don't forget, when he was playing with Manchester City, he was winning things. He wasn't playing in a, in a middle-of-the-table team. Now, I think he was one of the greats, and he was very similar to Gerd Muller. I mean, the, the, some, of the, some of your listeners will, will, will remember Gerd Muller sure. if they're a certain age. He was a great German player, played for Bayern Munich and Germany, of course. 
and he was very similar in 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 stature to him. You know, he's a short lad, quite stocky, very strong, very quick over over ten, fifteen, twenty yards. Uh, but they were great goal scorers, no doubt about it. And he's he's definitely. I feel sorry for him. He was with he happened to finish uh, in this in this situation with a, with heart problems. Uh, I mean, he was crying the other day, I believe, uh, in when he was finishing finishing off. Uh, but definitely one of the greats. Yeah, he was really, really, really great. Would you rank him as like like top five, top ten that we've seen in English football? He certainly like those figures that you quote there just suggest how dependable he is. We think of the the great moments that he provided for Manchester City, uh, the least you know, of which of course was that uh, league deciding goal against against QPR yes. a decade ago. Like I was watching that goal again during the week because obviously with him retiring, it, it got replayed over and over again. Uh, what got pointed out was that he takes a touch when ordinarily I think when that ball is fed to him by Mario Balotelli most strikers would have swung it at first time and try and put it again the far post he took the extra touch to get beyond the defender and then put it past the keeper which yeah. showed that even in the most high pressure situations yeah. like and, and there would have been no more high pressure situation I think he's probably faced ever than that he still had the presence of mind to take the touch that would have guaranteed him a better chance of scoring well that's what separate them uh, from, from the ordinary players uh, Richie you know the fact that he can do that and do it on a regular basis and do it when it matters. Mm-hmm. You know, you get some some players, you know, you score two goals, three goals in a match uh, when you're winning six or seven nil. But doing it when you really need it, and I remember that particular match because I was doing it for RTE at the time, it looked like it was all over, yeah. you know, and to, to come up with that at that particular, and not just then, but loads of times afterwards, as we saw, Richie, you know, it's a sign of a great, great, great player, great finisher, when they can do that, you know, get in the right position, anticipate the ball, then having the, the, the ability, right foot or left foot, balance to stick it in the back of the net. You know, it's a gift. And uh, he had that in in a major way. Yeah. Uh, people who have kind of underperformed, though, I guess, over the last while, Pierre-Emerick Aubameyang, he's been front and centre for Arsenal for the wrong reasons this week, stripped of the captaincy, not involved against West Ham then last night and don't think he will be uh, this coming weekend either um, people have, uh, some Arsenal fans were critical of how publicly this was carried out by Mikel Arteta what did you make of how the, the Aubameyang situation was handled by Arsenal this week I, I don't think he had any choice uh, Richie than, yeah. to, than to make a big deal of it I mean it was a big deal um, I mean this is, this is this, at least the second time publicly that he's, he's been caught out uh, not turning up uh, at all or, or being late I mean he's captain of the club and it's, 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 it shows a bad example to everybody uh, it's, it, on a personal level it's very very bad for him to be doing what he's doing and what, what, what could Arteta say you know does he make a, an excuse up tell the lie that he was he was injured or that that's, that's no good to the team to the club to anything else and I mean to be honest why he was made captain I don't know why. It seems an odd choice. I think he was very popular within the group. That's why, and I think he won a vote essentially among the players to be captain and to succeed Granit Xhaka who had yeah, his well, own issues then. So, well, look, th- to be honest, Richie, that's bad management. It's not good management. Hmm. You shouldn't have fellow players picking a captain. Actually, they did that with Xhaka, didn't they? Yeah, and exact same situation. Yeah. You know, because he's pally with the players. You don't look when you're a manager. You pick the player. You have to, you have to pick the player that's going to be your best captain. Not fellow players. I mean, they don't always get it right. It's your job. It's your responsibility to say, you're, my, this is my captain and this is what I have. I think it's, it's, it's passing the book when you put it to a vote of fellow players. Because if you like them, and I, I've, I've played with players, I've known players over the years, where it'd be interesting, it'd be hugely popular, right? But wouldn't be doing any stuff on the pitch. There's two different things in it, and, and, and vice versa. I've met a lot of, I've heard of a lot of captains who wouldn't be popular with their fellow players, but they'd be doing the job. That's all that matters. What struck it's me not about, about being popular with the, with the, with your with your colleagues. Yeah. What struck me about the whole Aubameyang situation is just in a general sense, how important in, in the modern game is something like captaincy? Because it strikes me as being a bit of a, a, a throwback. It doesn't seem to matter all that much anymore. So to make a big deal out of it seems. Uh, I don't know. Seems a bit of a stretch. Well, I think it means as much as it did in my day. But in my day, Richie, I must be honest. I think it was exaggerated. Mm. You know, because 
the captain is mainly is somebody who, first of all, does his stuff on the pitch. That's you bet. You, you better be. You know, he was always inspired the other lads. Well, most of the captains that I knew that were good captains were inspired by the display on the pitch and what they did to win matches. Not about sh- shouting and throwing their arms around and that. That's all usually done for the for the for the supporters. And on the pitch, you don't want anybody. You don't care as a player about the captain throwing his arms around. What you want him to do is play well mm. and do his stuff on the pitch. Do his job. You know that's how they inspire you. Not by shouting and throwing their arms around and, and playing to the crowd. So, like I don't, I think it was always exaggerated in my day, mm. uh, the captain. And I think even to this day, uh, it's it's exaggerated. I mean, if you, if you take, uh, 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 the captain oh, I mean, like, back, yeah, the last, you know, he's got to do his stuff. And like he was really doing his stuff when he was going for his contract to be renewed really doing it then but since he's funny enough I don't think it was a coincidence since he signed his new contract he hasn't been the same player yeah I think we possibly uh, could have seen the last of him in an Arsenal jersey I think <clears throat> when January rolls around they might be uh, mm. uh, as well to cash in while there's still 18 months in that contract and of course football and off the ball with thanks to Sky don't miss Tottenham versus Liverpool on Super Sunday Live on Sky Sports uh, listen John I won't be here next Thursday but so I want to wish you a very happy Christmas and a happy new year and all that kind of stuff and stay safe and stay well and hopefully I'll talk to you the other side of 2022 and you Richie thanks Cheers. again Cheers. all the best to you and to you Christmas and the listeners if I don't speak to them before then F- fingers crossed you get to speak to them John I'm just going to be off me holidays next week don't worry about me yeah, it's, you. it's just me being lazy yeah uh, listen John we'll talk to you again okay, take care Richie, thanks again uh, still to come loads on the show we're going to have Jerry Thornley updating us on the latest with Leinster and their game with Montpellier which is now of course not going ahead and we'll keep to up, keep you even up to date what's going on in the Premier League six minutes gone at Stamford Bridge Chelsea nil Everton nil keep it here Football on Off the Ball with Sky. Don't miss Tottenham versus Liverpool on Super Sunday. Live only on Sky Sports.